Please uh, get a seat. We want to try to start on time and maybe finish on time. Welcome to the quiet reading room. It's obviously not too quiet tonight. And I, and I hope it won't be. I hope you all have a lot of interesting things to say. Uh, my name is Scott Fisher. I'm the opinion page editor at the York Daily Record and Sunday News. I'll be your moderator this evening, but probably and hopefully not talking too much. The idea is for you to talk and to hear what you have to say about fixing York. Uh, it's not about my opinions or the newspaper's opinions. It's about your opinions tonight. Uh, so thank you so much for coming out. First, I, I want to thank uh, Martin Library and Brian Grimm for their gracious use of this un uh, room tonight. Uh, they were so accommodating, and uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful venue. We're so lucky to have uh, such a great library and facility in York. Uh, so thank you so much for, uh, for letting us use this room tonight. So what I'd like to do is introduce our panelists tonight. Um, and I'm going to give them a, I'm going to just quickly go down the, the line here, and then I'd like to just give them a chance to just say hi very briefly. So uh, starting over here, we have Kevin Schreiber, <laughs> State Representative Kevin Schreiber. We have Margie Orr, uh, the York City School Board President. We have uh, Eric Holmes, who is the uh, Superintendent of York City Schools. We have York Mayor Kim Bracey. Thank you for being here tonight. And we have Michael Dewery. Is that Dowery? Sorry. <laughs> we have David Michaels, who is the Fire Chief for York. Uh, we have Jim Gross, who is the director of uh, public works for York, right? And we have Shilvosky Buffalo, who is the economic development director for York. And, of course, we have Police Chief Wes Cayley. Thank you very much for coming. So let me just give you a chance to say hi to everybody. Oh, before I do that, I also wanted to mention in the audience, we have uh, Representative Kristen Phillips-Hill, and we have Representative Seth Grove. The, the, we're glad they were able to join us tonight. So. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. I pinky swear. I'll be very brief. I uh, just want to thank you, everyone, for, for coming out. Thank York Daily Record for hosting this. Uh, it is great to see such a diverse audience of city residents, non-city residents alike. Obviously, we all share a common goal, which is the health and vibrancy of our city and cities throughout Pennsylvania. And, and to that end, there is, I'm sure, a host of uh, reasons we can discuss tonight. And to use the word fix denotes that there's something wrong and that it's broken. So I hope tonight we can be very constructive and talking about how we can fix some of these issues that are very new and some that have uh, plagued our cities in Pennsylvania for decades. So to that end, thank you all for taking time out of your evening to come and be part of this constructive dialogue. And obviously it goes without saying that what's most important is that we carry this dialogue continue forward outside of this room and help inform a lot of the decisions that we make throughout the community and throughout our Commonwealth. So thank you all very much for coming out tonight. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I just encourage everyone, we have our elections coming up next month, and I just want to encourage everyone to come out, please, and vote, because the school district has a lot of people up for re-election, and we need your support. We need everyone. Our school district is the backbone of York City, so we need to protect our district, do everything we can for our children, and see that everyone strives for this order. So please come out and vote in November. Good evening, everyone. I'd also like to thank the uh, Daily Record for hosting this event. And thank you all for coming out on a, a wonderful Tuesday evening. It's a beautiful night. I'm sure we have other things that we could be doing. But it says a lot that so many people are here this evening uh, looking to do what they can to help here in the, in the, in the city of York. So I'm really excited to be here, looking forward to the discussions. Uh, and uh, I know that we will have a lot of positive outcomes because as I've said many times before, the answers to our problems can be found amongst us here in the city of York. Good evening, York. Good evening. It's good to see all of you. Thank you so very much for being here. As you know, my cabinet and I are not new to town hall meetings, so we look forward to this conversation. I want to also acknowledge some other city elected officials we have in place. We have Councilman Helfrich here, uh, our city controller, Robert Lambert, and I know there's some school board members sprinkled around as well, elected officials, Diane Glover, Jose Santiago, all of you guys. Thank you so very much and, uh, for being here and, and working. There's City Council President Carol Hill Evans in the back as well too. Good to see you. And a lot of appointed officials as well. We have some folks from our health bureau, our fire department, 
um, our City Human Relations Commission, my office, we are here because we believe in our community and working together to do the, all that we can to improve it. So thank you very much for being here. Good evening. I want to say thank you. This is my first uh, town hall meeting, so it's definitely a privilege to serve. Um, I'm here with two ears and one mouth. Uh, definitely want to hear what we have to say and uh, do, do what I can to help. Good evening. I'm happy to be here tonight to represent uh, the fire department and the firefighters throughout the city. Um, if you have any questions, if we don't get to them tonight, we can't answer them, uh, please get us afterwards. Also, Deputy Chief Theodorf is here tonight with us, so uh, please get him or I afterwards if, you, if one of your questions don't get answered, and uh, we'll be glad to help you. Good evening and welcome. Uh, I'm sitting here between mystery and supernatural, and I think that really describes public works. So, but on my way down here, I walked from City Hall and I passed a young lady who was sweeping her front porch or her front space with a, a broom and a small uh, dustpan, and I thanked her, and that's hey, that's what it's all about. That's how we fix York. So, thank you. Tough act to follow. Good evening, all. Shavosky Buffalo, interim director of the Economic and Community Development Department. Um, here with my colleagues, our shade of, I guess, the shade of what we do is a little bit different from police and fire. I'm um, not necessarily first responder, but definitely quality of life issues are more so in our bag. But glad to be here for you all this evening and look forward to the discussion. Good evening. Uh, th this seems to be my day for this sort of thing. I spent the afternoon with the chief from Harrisburg and the chief from Lancaster and Ron Martin from News 8 uh, getting grilled on something that you all will see at some point, I'm sure, uh, on TV discussing uh, the, the violence and crime issues in all of our cities. So it's good to be here tonight to focus on York, but uh, it, uh, it definitely has been a day for me of listening to, to people's issues and, and trying to come up with ways to, uh, to better what we do. Thank you so much for everybody, to everybody to, for coming tonight. I also would like to acknowledge, uh, I think I saw um, Judge Todd Platts is here tonight, so thank you for coming out. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a, a, a number of New York Daily Record staffers here today. We have Jim McClure, who's our editor, uh, Randy Parker, who is our managing editor, uh, Susan Martin over here. She is our, one of the mic runners tonight, so she's going to be coming and feeling your questions, so you'll get to know her. Scott Blanchard, our in, uh, investigative or, or, or enterprise editor, is over here. He's another mic runner, so he'll be uh, moving the mic around. Abigail Geiger is, is working the, the screen here. Uh, we have Mark Walters, who is uh, one of our reporters, and Dylan Sigelbaum, who is also a reporter. So if you, you could notice that we are live streaming this event, as is White Rose TV, uh, Community TV, and we're, we're glad they were able to join us tonight. Um, there will be a, a, a video of this session archived at YDR.com, so if you're interested in sharing it with somebody, feel free to do that. Um, if, if you're here tonight with your, your smartphone and you'd like to comment on what's happening and you're on Twitter, you might want to use the hashtag Fixing York. So if you comment on what, what's happening in the room, please use that. Also on the screen up here, you'll notice that we have our Fixing York Facebook group. And if you have your phone and you'd like to comment on some of the things that are going on tonight or things that are being discussed, please go ahead and, and, and use your, your phone and comment on this. Uh, Abigail will keep in, be keeping track of that and she'll be sort of keeping notes for the evening and we'd, we'd like to sort of sum things up at the end. So what, what is Fixing York and uh, what are we hoping to accomplish tonight? Uh, I'd like to just sort of turn this over at this point to Mark Walters who uh, Fixing York has been his baby. He's, he's the, our city reporter, and he's really kept a really close eye and been a really engaged uh, commenter on Fixing York uh, PA Facebook group. And he's going to talk a little bit about what was the genesis for this initiative? Why are we doing this? Thanks, Scott. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here, public officials, citizens alike. Um, my name's Mark Walters. I cover the city beat for the York Daily Record. Um, and I have some, some remarks here on my phone. When I interviewed for this job, uh, managing editor Randy Parker and Jim McClure sat me down and they basically told me, we want you so immersed in the city that when you hear about shots fired or a fire in the 300 block of any street in the city, we want you to think of someone that you know in the area that you want to check on that might be all right. Um, and 
In a city of approximately 45,000 people, I'd say I got about 44,550 yet to go. <laughs> but um, I, I started in February. I, um, I grew up in, in the area, so to be here covering the city has, has always been a, a dream of mine. Um, The, the, the immersion that Randy had talked about was city life and focusing more on that than city politics um, to really get after what people do care about and what goes on in their neighborhood. Um, so what's city life? We started with neighborhood coverage, which has featured profiles so far on Salem Square, the avenues, Old Town East, and three others. Um, keep an eye out for Fireside, Historic Newton Square, and Locust Street in the coming weeks. Fixing York was launched in March, and it has blossomed into what I like to think of as an organic incubator, think tank, and focus group for me as the city reporter to connect with city life. Um, to liken it to the farm to table trend in the culinary industry, you could call it this York's street to story initiative. We as journalists don't intend to ourselves uh, fix York, but we want to help it along. Um, and we want to be there for the community to help tell their stories. The virtual community was launched by us for you as a way to better connect with our readers and the community we've covered. We cover. We've received criticisms that the group is just another way for us to collect story ideas. That is 100% accurate, and I personally am not going to apologize for that. <laughs> as journalists, we're always looking for leads and tips. Being that we don't fabricate the news, we need to hear from people about what's going on. Fixing York is uh, your opportunity, among many others, to do just that. We often hear people say that we report on more negative news than positive news. I don't agree with that. We know there are more positive York City stories than negative ones. We just need to find them, and we need you to help us do that. So what do you care about? What hopes and fears do you have for York? What kind of stories do you want to read? What's going on in your city neighborhood that you think we should know about? We've surpassed 1,800 members in about seven months. The group has fostered some small-scale fixes, such as a lewd graffiti cleanup at Lincoln Park. That was, I think, really neat that the city was a part of it, as well as a mom that came to Fixing York and said, I don't like this. My kid saw this at the park. And uh, Steve Kleinitz over here is 50% um, of the founding members of Punks for Positivity, who also had a hand in that cleanup. So, Steve. And, and the city for that, because they got out on Saturday and got what they found. Uh, Steve went there on Sunday and got a few extra pieces that, that were, were not originally discovered. Um, so where am I here? Almost done, I promise. As Scott said, the group has become my baby. I make it my point to read every comment, thread, post, reply uh, in the entire group. And that gets daunting. I monitor it on my phone from the dinner table, weddings, dog walks, um, various other places where I'd rather not be thinking about work. Um, tonight, welcome. We wanted to have a live in-person rendition of that Facebook group. And uh, to put names to faces, to welcome people, to welcome public officials to the conversation, and to hear from you about your thoughts, concerns, and yes, even your story ideas. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> okay, so as Mark said, we thought it would be a good idea to, to bring people together in a room and, and you know, bring social media to life, to real life. And so what we want to do is we have kind of an open agenda tonight. Uh, we, we, don't have, we have some ideas of things that we might want to talk about, but we don't have to. We want to leave it up to you. Uh, so what we're going to do is uh, basically open the agenda to anybody who wants to get up and talk. I will give uh, our panelists an opportunity to respond if they have anything that they'd like to comment on regarding those issues. What I would like to ask, though, is, is that when you talk, try to keep it concise, about a minute or so of talking. Uh, that way we'll get a chance to get to a lots of different thoughts and, and issues tonight. So um, why don't we run, open it up to, uh, is, is there anybody who has anything like the talk? And, and let me also make this clear is that this is not really a beating up of people session. The idea is to be positive. This uh, Fixing New York is about coming up with solutions, grassroots solutions, things that regular people in their community can do to make this a better city and a better place to live. 
Uh, so what we'd really like to hear about is, is those kinds of ideas, the, the, the punks for positivities, the, the folks getting out and cleaning up litter, that kind of thing. Does anybody, would, would anybody like to start? I see somebody over here. Um, hi, my name is Wanda, and um, one of the things that, one of my concerns is, I hear a lot about uh, revitalization of the city, which is great, it's really great, but I don't see it across the board. It's more revitalization so that we get like college students or we get other people to come into the city, but what about the people that already live here? I mean, there's, there's people that are low income and they're living in horrible conditions. Um, I, I, for myself, you know, I'm college educated, but I was homeless for a spell. So I've seen like all different walks of life and I've seen all different people and all different economic situations. And I think we need to address everybody, not just a select part of the population in York. Because there's so many people out there that, you know, children shouldn't have to live in an apartment with bed bugs and a bad landlord. So if you revitalize that, if you make the people healthy, you're gonna have a stronger, better community. Would, would anybody like to address that? No? no? Yes. I can certainly. Uh, was it Wanda? And I don't know if we're, I'll stand up just so everyone can see. Um, I, I, th I think you absolutely raised a very good point uh, and, and something that's often a challenge that a lot of municipalities have, a lot of big cities uh, also, you know, sort of the balance of doing neighborhood and downtown type revitalization. In a city our size, 5.2 square miles, you know, 43,000 in population, Every aspect of this city, whether it's the central business district, the core areas, they're still neighborhoods in and of themselves. What I would say, though, is over the past couple years, we have, you know, while there are a lot of headline grabbing projects from Santander Stadium to revitalization in the downtown, we've had several very strong neighborhood redevelopments, too, starting, you know, many years ago with the Boundary Avenue project and Crispus Attucks really leading that area. Salem Square has had about $6 million of investment to deconcentrate some of those areas that were multi-units to provide single-family housing that was affordable in nature, working with partners like Habitat for Humanity, trying to improve the infrastructure, streetscaping, lighting, public safety, the uh, elimination of a nuisance bar that had caused a whole lot of problems in the area and, and conversion of that to some better community asset. The Old Town East neighborhood was the first Elm Street in our Commonwealth. That was a state program that invested money specifically in neighborhoods to try to improve home ownership, improve public safety. That also saw you know, several million dollars of investment. The challenge is how do you keep it going and how do you connect all those dots and how do you bleed it out? And a lot of it is absolutely funding based. A lot of those projects that we've worked on throughout our neighborhoods, throughout the city, are all you know, precursor by virtue of a funding program that was available at the time. A lot of those programs that we used to use have since evaporated through the recession. You know, the federal government has less money to invest, the state government certainly, and then the local government is, is very, very limited. So a lot of what we've done is try to be the seed of revitalization in hopes that the private market can take it over from there. And we've seen it happen in some cases, but others certainly not much. And I think the challenge is incumbent on all of us and all of our real anchor organizations to help pick up where a government can, can start the process, but really has to hand it over to a lot of the community organizations and a lot of the neighbors. And we see that with all those organizations. I mentioned the YM, the YW, Habitats, um, and, and even our neighborhood associations. But it's absolutely a challenge, and it's always a, a, a fine line to, to walk to try to ensure you're doing absolute everything you can to stabilize a neighborhood, make every neighborhood in the city one that people want to live in, people feel safe in, and that also improves the investor confidence in the area. And that, at its core, is everything that economic and community development is, is improving some version of investor confidence. Okay, great, thank you. We have at Hennepin. I work 7A to 7P, and I dread every third weekend and every holiday because of the partying. I've at least called the police five times because of the noise that goes on until three, four o'clock in the morning, and the vibrations, my wind is rattled. So when I called the police, they said, do you know where the noise is? And I said, well, it would be nice if, if I could tell you, but since every street light on my block is out, I have no idea. So I, I know I, I, call, I called twice to the electric company, to Met Ed, to get the lights fixed. And uh, I called the mayor's office twice. 
and it wasn't until the second call of the mayor's office that I had something done because somebody got across the street, got shot. Two people got shot with a BB gun. Do anybody like to address that from the, yeah? I just, want to, I just want to tell you, there is a way to report street lights that are out. It's on our website. Uh, all we need is the poll number. Every poll should have a number on there. Uh, we can report that to MedEd for you, uh, but we need the information, obviously. We, we can't know every street light that's out in the city. But it, there is a way to do that. If you get us that information, um, we will definitely get it reported to you, and MedEd is pretty good at, at getting those lights repaired. So. Um. Uh, they don't all have have numbers on because I just reported one the other day, and the, it's a med ed one, and it has no numbers. Okay. Sure. Yeah, we we would actually love it if you would stand. Oh, you want you want to talk? No. No, I just would appreciate if whoever is speaking would stand up. It makes it a little easier to listen. Thank you very much. Does anybody else, any other issues we'd like to talk to? Michael? Just well, I just wanted to, to swing back to the issue of how we kind of invest our money in the city. And this is very difficult because while all of our neighborhoods uh, need help, we all need help, uh, there's only really other than up around Route 30, there's only one place that we can invest where we're hoping that a lot of money comes back in and then we can use that money for the programs that we need all over the place. So in the, in the kind of spirit of fixing York, I'm hoping that as we're building uh, some income, the, the actual value of the city has been going down, which hurts because we're running, we, we have less money every time the city goes down. But as more money comes in, if we can work to um, bring the education centers back into the neighborhoods, as we all know, education is where all improvements start in our community. So if we can get you know, the Jefferson Center up and running and the Princess, Princess Center and all these centers that are around the city, get the job training, get the job pre preparation back into the city neighborhoods instead of most of it being out on Pennsylvania Avenue outside of the city. If we can take our money and bring those centers back in, we'll be doing a lot to improve all those neighborhoods. Thank you. Um, thanks. Hi, my name's Kathy. Um, I was wondering if there's any legislation to make landlords more accountable for um, some of the um, things that they don't fix and where people don't live in uh, very good housing. And also, is there any ideas to bring people back in to own their homes again so we can get a better tax base and uh, make landlords maybe pay more taxes or whatever. I was just wondering if there's anything like that on the table or what was going on. Thank you. Anybody? Yeah. Uh, okay, <laughs> very brief. So yes, the, your answer is yes. Uh, it, it, going back, I think it was 2009, and, and I'll actually give uh, Seth a shout out because he was in the General Assembly at this point. Act 90 was done, which gave municipalities a whole host of tools to go after uh, absentee landlords and problem properties. Uh, as the process with legislation, sometimes it gets watered down towards the end, but still there were a lot of really good tools in there, and many of which have actually been implemented. Uh, following up to that, there was the conservatorship law that passed, which allowed municipal governments, redevelopment authorities, nonprofits to, to try to apply for conservatorship of vacant properties, and then there was the land bank authority law that was passed as well. So there was a host, you know, a package of them. A lot of those tools are being utilized now. They're still somewhat in their infancy. Some are being challenged in court. Uh, and then there's, there's definitely a, sort of another wave uh, that the Pennsylvania Housing Alliance is really pushing. And, and to some degree, it's, it's um, the Housing Trust Fund, which would create a statewide housing trust fund, trust fund that would dedicate a, a, some amount of money to help put towards blight remediation and things of that nature. And then on your question of home ownership, the city and county both have a first time home buyer program, very limited in resources. It can help provide uh, closing cost and down payment assistance. But again, a lot of that is based on federal money, much of which has, has 
been drawn back and was cut by about 36% back in 2010. So there's some programs, and I'll just give a shout out to the, the employers that we have. We have a lot of employers that have started their own programs, Wellspan, York College, CGA Law Firm, York Revolution, uh, to, in, to offer uh, down payment and closing cost assist assistance to employees that want to buy in the city as well. Thank you, thank you. We have, we have one, one back here. So it would be great if somebody could talk about some ideas for fixing York, some grassroots ideas. If, if anybody has any of those kinds of uh, thoughts, try to, try to get this up. We'll, we'll start here. <laughs> of course. You're correct, yes. Uh, I didn't pay you to ask that question, but I'll certainly use it as a bully pulpit to say perhaps there is an opportunity, and if anyone, it, you know, not suggesting we wrap early, but there is a commissioner's debate going on right now, too, so you should make, it your, make that an issue, part, discuss that. But yes, the, obviously the city's part of the county. We're one of 72 municipalities, but we are the largest, and we're 10% of the population. The city, by virtue of, of resources that I mentioned, I was referring mostly to federal resources, you know, in... In my limited span of the, the years that I served with the city, and certainly the mayor I know has, has even more depth of knowledge on this one, but I, I saw community development block grant dollars go from about 1.8 million to just shy of a million. Uh, we saw home money go from 550,000 to 335,000, I think we're at right now. So we've seen a dramatic reduction. It still sounds like a lot, but that doesn't accomplish a whole lot. On the converse side, on the county side, they receive about 3 million in CDBG. I'm not sure about home, they're probably over a million. Um, but again, they disperse that generally outside of the city, and I think we do need to foster uh, a better conversation between trying to collaborate and partner and, and best maximize some of those resources. And some of that dialogue is going on, but I think our county commissioners and, and all of the agencies uh, need to hear from residents too to, to request that. Thank you. We had, we had some uh, back here. Did you want to talk? Hang on, hang on a second. <laughs> If you're in a block where houses were whole houses and converted and had our neighborhoods not let that happen and it's still happening then the system to try that from happening and we're involved and did everything way within the system how wouldn't you lose faith then in that Um, there's no help for us to keep that security or buffer zone to keep that block stable. Not even in home, but the absentee landlord just own it and take it away. Shootings like each corner. Positive. Can you tell me that I'm supposed to think it's getting better? Okay. D does anybody have any response? Do you have anything you want to say? Yeah, Shabowski. Good afternoon. Actually, good evening. Um, that's a tough alliterative of questions. I mean, there's about five things you, you trail together. Um, and I'm not going to pretend to have a definitive answer about what one solution is over another. Um, I, too, live in a challenged neighborhood. Can you not hear me? Am I too low? All right, I'll, I'll try not to eat the mic. Um, I too live in a neighborhood that's challenged and I too share some of the same issues that you do as a city resident. And there's no immediate definitive solution in terms of what the city can offer. We're really, it's one of those things where we're collectively in this together. So that vigilance that you have as a homeowner on that block kind of strikes a balance to the issues that aren't necessarily in sync with those things that you would like to see that are a benefit to you all. I mean, it's, 
I don't want to talk circular. I don't want to. I don't want to talk too, too, uh, too broadly. But I, there's no real clear-cut solution. I mean, the block that you live on is actually the first Elm Street neighborhood that you pointed out, Kevin, earlier, and it's been a significant amount of investment there. And it's one of those things where we haven't thrown in the committed towel in terms of being there and being able to provide resources. But the issue sometimes exceeds the resources that we have in terms of being able to bring those to bear to address the solution. Um, but again, like I say, I don't have an immediate off the cuff Johnny on the spot answer for you. I mean, it's one of those things where we try to be as responsive as we can and address the issues as they come up, whether it's a policing issue or a quality of life issue with codes or some other aspect of just landlord tenant disputes or neighborly disputes. So I don't necessarily know if I've given any shade of, uh, of light on your, on your question. Okay. Uh, did you did you have anything else you wanted to say? <laughs> no. No. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that comment. Let's move. can tell you this. I came to this meeting because I thought there was going to be upbeat and positivity and I haven't heard it yet. And I think if we want to have a better community, we have to be positive. My mother-in-law told my husband and I, what the, why would you want to move to York? And I said, why not? Um, and the cost of living is coming from Seattle was incredible. I, I love it here. I love that I walked out my door and I came down here by myself. Um, what can we do? We can clean up the litter in front of our house. We can plant flowers by the trees in front of our house. I've already done that. Do it. Get out there and do it. I, don't, I mean, I'm not saying doing it at midnight. I'm not saying doing it at 3 a.m. in the morning. But do it in the daytime or do it on the weekends. And and make a difference in the little area that you occupy. That's, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Does anybody else have any, any, po any positive ideas? I, over here? We have one right here. Susan? Susan, over here. Hello, I'm Rebecca Cook. I live in the avenues. And I second what the speaker just said about getting out there and taking responsibility for our immediate neighborhoods and stop complaining about the litter. My husband has done that for the last three years. He has uh, daily cleaned Parker and Kiwanis Lake parks in our neighborhood. The other thing we do all the time is call the police, have a good relationship with them when we see any crime happening, because how are they going to be able to address it if they don't know about it? I have two other things. Sunday, we met a couple walking in Farker Park. They were at the Graham Aquatic Center. Their daughter was at a meet. There are dozens of people who come in every weekend for that kind of activity. These people said to us, there's nothing to do in York. Saturday afternoon, the sidewalks were rolled up. We tried to go into town on Sunday for a cup of coffee. Nothing. Uh, that is a loss pool of money if uh, some kind of development would take place, down, business owners, you hear what I'm saying? Something happening on s weekends that these people can uh, take advantage of and for the Graham Center to publicize it. And the last thing, there are, there seem to be no drop-in centers with activities for teens and will help keep them off the street. The Y has programs, you have to sign up in advance. 
Same with CA. There is no place in neighborhoods where kids can just go and hang out instead of cruising the streets. Thank you. Thank you very much. What's your heart? Hi, I'm Paula. I work here at Martin Library, and I love everything you said except for the last thing. There are places for kids here. The library is your place in this community. If there is nothing else positive said tonight, please understand we are here for every single child in this community. I have been here 30 years. I love York, and I want to see it succeed. What we need is your positive attitude. We need to have parents and everybody in the community understand that what is going to save York is our kids. If we can't make a positive difference and get out there and say yes for our kids, it's not going to change, folks. We need our kids to see that we are doing something for them. We need every parent to stand up and say, I'm going to make a difference for my kid. And we need everybody to understand that York City Schools are here for our children. The library is here. We are open Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Every day we are open. We are free. There's free programs for kids. There are free programs for parents. We have job search available. We have stuff here to help parents find jobs. We have things here that people can connect to in the community. We are your community. This library is here for York, and God bless us. If we can't help you be better, I don't know who else can. Thank you. We have somebody over here across the room, uh, Scott. Scott, did you have somebody you wanted to talk? Hi. Um, I have one more comment. Um, it seems like, I mean, I've lived here for like nine years now in New York uh, after college. And since I lived here, I, I mean, there was a period of time where York City went downhill for a while and like almost all development stopped. But I've noticed in the last four or five years, a lot of things, positive things have happened. Um, um, the whole area around White Rose, the art district, that's, that's been really nice to see. Um, and the Royal Squ Square development people, I mean, and the um, north end of town being worked on. So th that's a nice positive thing to see. But I've noticed like a lot of the issues that we have in the city, from schools to crime to blighted neighborhoods, has to do with the fact that we have limited resources. And part of the uh, limited resources, are, you know, we, we have to have a tax base. but the problem is is like we're I see a lot of companies leaving York um, we had Johnson Controls leaving York we have dent supply that shut down some operations and moved um, so that just I mean we're just getting less and less money to work with is are there any concrete besides besides opening up bars and trying to get people down here um, is there any other ideas out there um, I mean I, I, I see the um, the um, what is it the tech center that's that's gonna open up here, but is there, do you know of any other ideas or programs or anything that's gonna promote more, basically job growth in the city? Because it seems like all the jobs are happening outside the city. So I think that's a huge thing that we have to think about. Thank you. I just wanted to suggest that, looping back to the things to do in the city, uh, Superintendent Holmes, the, the, the schools are open for, for a pro there are a lot of things for kids to do after school as well, right? Would you like to talk about that, Mike? For the second year now, we have an after school program in the school district of the city of York where we provide activities for students uh, from the end of the day, which is now extended to 4 o'clock, to 6.30. Uh, any student without any cost can participate in the after school activities. It is a partnership that we have with the Martin Library. Uh, they provide the after school uh, tutors. Uh, we have enrichment programs as well as um, recreational programs for kids. And we feed them dinner every night from Monday through Friday. And it goes from 4 to 6.30. And doesn't cost a dime. And we encourage you to talk about it amongst your neighbors and get your neighbors to make sure their kids are coming. All they need to do is sign up and they can be there. And we're doing it for two reasons. First of all, we want to extend the day and continue that learning process for two and a half hours. Number two, we want to keep our kids safe and off the streets and out of trouble. So there are activities that we have for kids that we're sponsoring 
uh, through the school district of the city of York. Thank you so much. Does anybody else have any uh, positive ideas? Do I things that can improve it? You've been waiting here. Oh, I'm sorry. You're next. I promise. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my name's Judy, and I'm president of the Story Newton Square Neighborhood Association. And uh, I, first of all, just wanted to say that in my role, I am often contacting uh, city people. Um, some of you know me. I've called often, <laughs> often with a, a sorry to be bothering you again. But I've always had really good response. It's been our experience um, within our neighborhood that when there's an issue, um, we call and somebody does their best to try to help us. And if they can't, they send it to somebody who can. So I thank you for that. Um, and my positive um, comment would be, and my, maybe my suggestion of what could be done, um, I'm an educator, and, uh, and I really appreciated uh, your college doing their Spartan Day of Service in our community. And um, it, it makes me wonder if, um, Dr. Holmes, if there's some way that um, the school could involve your junior high and high school students to make part of their curriculum doing community work. That if they do Saturdays or even after school times, when instead of being entertained or homework, they go to a neighborhood and they clean it up, um, maybe they would be a little more in tune to what it means and take pride in. And also, when you, when you kick your butt to clean something up, you're a little less likely to throw paper or your garbage and maybe to get your friends not to do it either. So I, I think that would be a really nice way to incorporate the student body into the community and help them learn to appreciate what they have here in the city and, and show that appreciation in, in some way and then learn from that also. And I know our association would be really happy to work with you and I'm sure many of the other neighborhood associations the same way. Um, we have a lot of children walk through our neighborhood because we're right near the high school and, um, and in fact we want to get the change letters put on uh, an area in our neighborhood and, and I wanted to talk to you guys about that and how we could work together but I, I think that might be it does start with the children. I mean, all of this change is going to take time, but it, it's going to come from the children that are coming up now. And making them more responsible and involved in our community, I think, is maybe a first step. So just my suggestion. Thank you. Community service requirements for all students at York High. You can't graduate without performing a certain number of, of community service hours. Mm -hmm. So if there's any organization here that would like to have students participate, in some of these activities, uh, let me know. We'll put you in contact with the high school because kids are always looking for a way to get their hours done. Uh, and so if you have anything that you'd like them to do, let us know. Great, thank you so much. And Kevin wanted to make a quick comment. Quick comment, I, awesome idea, Judy. And I think, how about this for an idea? Your college, just, I can't take credit for this one. They're totally floating this one and it hasn't been approved yet, but Student Senate, they thought about having the Greek life on York College adopt Jackson Street for cleanups. So awesome idea. That's another you know, very similar to that and hopefully lend some of that ownership. Thank you. I, I promised to this gentleman over here. <laughs> David Kennedy. Um, I just moved back here from Phoenix, Arizona. Born and raised here. I was actually in Dr. Dr. Holmes' very first black history class at York High. <clears throat> what I want to say is some of the things that I've noticed being back here, I've been back here for about a month. There has been change here in York. The city has been changing in a positive manner. Now me being in Arizona, I've been on the outside looking in, but I always continue to follow the city where I grew up in. I often would hear and see negativity throughout the news. I'm sorry, Mr. Newsman, but that's all you guys report. Not all. I'm sorry. I'll take that back. I was just recently in the news for a positive manner, so I take that back, sir. <laughs> yeah, I take that back. The opinion, I should say, is that you're always promoting negativity. Now, one thing that I've been doing since I've been back here is working with the uh, enrichment programs. Uh, Dr. Holmes, you don't know yet, I'm working my way to, towards you. I'll be seeing you so shortly. <laughs> um, since I've been here, I've worked with uh, York High. I will be doing an assembly there. 
I've spoken to McKinley, K through eight, Hannah Penn, and I just spoke with Phineas Davis today. The problem that I'm seeing and that I'm having personally, for one, what happened to my high school? Why does my high school have this reputation of being a horrible place to go? It's not where I came from, it's not where he taught. And I know for sure by having that teacher that he's not running the whole district that way. So, the point that I'm making is, it starts with you at home, get your kids right, there are programs out there. But the commonality that I'm hearing is, no one wants to touch the inner city schools. You know, me, myself, I'm going in, I'm gonna be doing motivational speaking, but my speech alone will not change the world. So what I'm asking from the citizens of York, especially if you live inside the city, do your part. I spoke with Principal Carter. He's saying everyone talks about York, outside, uh, York High outside of York High. No one's coming inside the school to see what they offer. You know, all I see and hear is how bad these kids are. But when you walk the hallways like I did, I saw nothing but positivity. No kid in that high school should have to eat. They have food, they have clothes, they have a library that's immaculate. I'm like, where was that when I was going to school? They have a program that will actually pay for your entire education if you just do this, that, and the other. So the point that I'm making is there are positive things going on, but you right now have to do your part, get involved, talk to Dr. Holmes or, or talk to the teachers, talk to the schools, talk to the principals, get involved. As I said, I'm about to do all kinds of speeches and motivational things while I'm there, but it's going to take more than me. We need more participation. Thank you very much. Susan. Hello, good evening. Excuse my attire. I was out getting my exercise on, but I just want to um, interject. I came in because I couldn't find a way to park. I'm all the way up on King Street, but I'm here. My youngest is 19, my oldest will be 31, but I have a grandson here that I'm going to stay on top of. And me, honestly, I feel as though the parent need to be involved too. He don't understand, yeah, when you go for football practice, I'm down there to pick you up. Wherever you're going, I want to know where you go. And there is things to do in your, because you've got to reach outside of your box. Me, I reached outside my box, I went to a poetry reading, I went to painting. There is positive things to do here. You just got to reach out and want to do these things. Now, what my grandson was saying, he'd be 15 on Thursday. I rode him around trying to find him a job. He said he can't come to the library because he's hiding, because he owes a book. And then he said, um, for the other programs, they end at 630, but I won't allow that ripping and running the streets. I want something positive for that high school to do. And if there's anybody that has information, is there a website where I can go look? Because, you know, I'm getting a grandson. But like I raised mine back in the 70s, 80s, he's going to be raised the same way with respect for his city, me, and himself. Thank you. Scott, do you have someone? You're next, Dina. Hi, I'm Lois Garnett. I'm a member of the York City School Board, and I'm also a retired teacher. And I have to agree with the gentleman way over there. Um, there are good things that go on at York High retired four years ago, and I was not afraid to go to work. So if you have any concerns, I do urge you to come in. People from the surrounding areas, and if I, if I hurt your feelings, I'm just going to have to apologize now, people are afraid to come to York because of the perception. And when I was in my classroom, I used to tell my students, you have to rise above. You have to be better than that because everybody out there thinks you're bad because you come from York. That's one thing. The one thing I would like to see on a totally different note is I know there are things that go on in York and the city school district has begun through hiring um, a former reporter, I guess I can say that, um, <laughs> to be our communication person. But I would love to see somebody to disseminate the things that are going on in the city. There are often relays, runs, walks for whatever purpose and we don't know about it not everybody has access to a computer not everybody watches the white rose television and i'm not sure what the magic answer is to it 
but I think part of what our problem is that I think we could fix very easily is to promote ourselves. You know, it's like Harrisburg, Lancaster, York. We need to get ourselves out of that York, that bottom. And I know that if, if we had some way to disseminate some information, if some way to maybe develop some pride in this city, and I hear it and I see it, but we need to, you know, move it out of these doors. But I just think if we had a communication from the top of these are the things happening in York, because there are things happening. We just don't all know about it. And they're good things. It isn't, you know, all the bad stuff, but I think we need to really promote ourselves better. Thank you. I'd like to mention that uh, Mayor Bracey wanted me to, to note that there are some materials on the table over here where the water is uh, that uh, pro talk about city programs and, and things that are, that are offered by the city, right? So please take a, a chance to take a look at that. Uh, we have one over here. And then we actually have some questions from home from people who are watching online. I was coerced into talking because I talked to Scotty earlier. Uh, I was on the school board 25 years ago. I'm not hearing anything we didn't hear 25 years ago. The place that must be addressed is the bottom 20% of the community. Everybody here talks about kids going home and everything. Well, let me tell you, they don't have homes to go to. They have a place, not even a home. Thinking outside of the box, where can kids go to get everything they need? No one's raising their hand. The Hershey School. Why can't we get the York Foundation and get a lot of other people and have a satellite Hershey School in York? It'll be copied everywhere else. I know I've done research. There's think reasons why it's going to be challenging. But until we get these kids into a stable life from 9 at night till 7 in the morning, all that keeps happening is festering, and, and uh, Wes knows. Um, the festering that is, under, uh, is underneath. On the positive side, the band looked great at the fair. <laughs> Wonderful. I was so pleased to see, um, to see them there. I was going to mention the York College, um, uh, York College kids. But we found out charters aren't the answer. So now let's address it in another, in another way. When I was on the school board, we heard a speaker from Washington, and he said, if you take all the money that a student, a child gets from the government, everything, you could house them at no additional cost in a facility like Hershey School. Now think about that. The potential's there. So those are the kids I'm more concerned about in, in helping that level. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Abigail, you had some questions from home? Yeah. Hi, I'm Abigail. I work for the YDR. Um, we had a couple. We have a comment up on our Facebook page. We have a comment on our uh, Fixing York Facebook page that if anybody's on their phones, they can leave a comment on. And I just pulled a couple of the questions from it, and I've added it to this document that I'm kind of writing minutes, I guess, for. Um, one of the questions was about an update on the school recovery plan that a lot of you probably know about and have been following. And also, the second question was, uh, what can be done to get a science center building somewhere downtown with a planetarium? That's an interesting idea. OK, uh, Scott, had, had somebody right here? I'll be, I'll be here with you. Here we go, thank you. Um, a couple of things that people said that I thought was really interesting, and one of the things that I wrote on Fixing York at one time is that we don't speak about York in positive terms. Um, so every time, that, one thing that you guys can do is that every time someone says, oh, I don't wanna go to York, I'm gonna get shot, to challenge that thought and speak positively and don't perpetuate that negativity. Crime happens everywhere. If we didn't have crime, there would be no need for police. So stop pretending like York is the only place that has crime. But speak about York in positive terms as much as you possibly can. There's wonderful things happening here. I'm so 
excited to come back to York and see all these positive things that have been happening, but I think the negativity that is perpetuated with many of the people, maybe not in this room specifically, but online, please challenge that and talk about something positive about York. If we keep talking about the negative, that is what the perception is going to, it's going to stay that way. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. We had somebody here. Hi, my name is Bob, and I want to kind of go on with what the lady who moved here from Seattle said about putting the flowers out. That there is a shortage of currency, money currency, but there's other currency. And, and one of them is love of something, like flowers, plant flowers, if you love flowers. And I'm a lifelong animal trainer, and we moved here a few months ago and bought a really nice house cheap, and we like living here. Uh, but one of the most unusual things about this city is the threatening dogs. I've never lived anywhere where when you walk your dog or you walk down the street, there, there seem to be uh, a lot of aggressive dogs here. And I've asked people, how many, what's the percentage of pit bulls in this city? And everybody says 30, 40 percent. Nationally, it's 6 percent. There's a lot of pit bulls who are, uh, the dogs are bred to be aggressive, to fight in a pit. And they can be trained. As a lifelong animal trainer, people love dogs. And if you can connect people who love dogs, and there are wonderful amateur uh, dog trainers, and started a, a prototype program here of dog trainers to teach these kids and, and dog owners how to simply train a dog. I've, I've been here now three months, and I've seen maybe two dogs that I consider well-trained. People just don't know how. And so to, to take that love of animals and love of dogs and share it would be a wonderful thing, and I think quite easy. Thank you very much. You're next. Oh, I got a, a question for, oh, yeah, I got a question for uh, Kim and uh, city police about uh, the funding, maybe like to get some cameras in the high crime areas for York, uh, because, uh, because some of the areas in York got very high crime, okay. I'm a lifelong resident, and they always say about we can't get the cameras because of the funding. Um, I don't know if it's at the state or federal level, but I know you guys get state money, federal money. And from the tax sales they have, when they have those tax sales for, uh, you know, whatever they take from the drug dealers or whatever, um, couldn't they put a percentage of that money to get some of these cameras in the high crime areas? You don't have to get them all at once, but I mean, it's been years now. I mean, you can get a camera every year, one camera. You know, what are we waiting for? Because everybody's scared. You get the cameras in, I'm pretty sure it's going to cut down on some of this crime. And it's not everywhere, just the high crime areas. You guys know where they're at. We all know where they're at. So, I mean, we don't need them all at once. Just, just lay, a, lay, a, lay a foundation where we can get one this year, one next year, one there. If we did that for the last 20 years, we'd have cameras all over the place because they've been out for a while. I don't know the statistics in Lancaster, but I know it's, uh, it had to go down. And you can catch more people like that that's doing the, doing the crimes. So that would help everybody. And if the crime goes down, then everybody would, you know, feel a little safer and they would come back to the city part of that. You know, they feel safe when they see the cameras. Would you like to respond to that? Uh, we're always compared to Lancaster. Uh, the UCR reports just came out for last year. If you look at them, our violent crime rate was lower than that than, Lan than Lancaster had. It was lower than Harrisburg. It was lower than a lot of cities in Pennsylvania. So w we need to educate ourselves on what we're really talking about. People talk about perceptions and we want to say, oh, this happened or that happened. We're, we're worse than Lancaster. We're worse than Harrisburg. We're worse than wherever. And we keep downing ourselves. A lot less people. Sure. A lot less people. But that, doesn't, that all factors into the crime rate. So... We're, we're doing well. We're not where we need to be by any stretch of the imagination. I love the ideas of cameras. I would love to see that. We have that conversation quite often uh, with various people looking for the funding to do that. I would love to set it up. I think Lancaster has a great program as far as their cameras go because it's not run by the government. All right? It's run by a private entity that then cooperates with the government. The other thing, 
you go around this city. Have you just, ever talked to business, uh, local business mm-hmm. owners? Oh, we keep now? talking about it, yeah. One, one thing that, that I'll tell you that Lancaster has over York that, that I see is their business community is much more involved in pushing the city forward. Uh, there's, uh, there's foundations set up to move things along to help with defray costs. I mean, they're, they're really deeply involved. And it's not something that we couldn't do here in York. We just have to, to do that. But we have the conversation quite often. But there are so many private cameras in York right now. When we have a crime, a lot of times it's called on film. There's, you know, people want to talk about privacy issues. There's not too many places you can go anymore that there's not a camera. There's not too many places that someone doesn't have a cell phone out filming what you're doing. But, uh, you know, cry, the, uh, the cameras are a great idea. I'd love to see it happen. Uh, I'm willing to partner with anybody that, that's interested in that. My only caveat every time I talk to someone about this is I personally, and I don't, can't speak for the mayor, she might, might not agree with this or not, but I don't believe that the government should be involved in that. I believe it should be a private entity. I think Lancaster has a great model for the, for the way they do things. Why shouldn't the government be involved? Uh, it takes away that concern of uh, invasion of privacy and those sorts of things. If you look at Lancaster, they have a great partnership going. And to, to solve crime problems, the government can't do it all. There has to be a partnership. So once again, it brings that partnership between the private entities and the community together with law enforcement to work on the problem. If the government just does everything, everybody just sits back and does nothing. I'm not saying they shouldn't put their money into it. What I'm saying is, and please don't kill me, Mayor, but what I'm saying is they shouldn't send us their money to do that. They should, they should invest it together in partnership uh, to, to make sure it happens. All right? Okay. Sure. Thank you so much. Okay. Susan has some... Hi, I'm Dawn Squire, and I'm very humbled to say that I'm part of a group of very committed citizens that are in the process of developing a dormitory-style home, exactly like you're talking about, to address the needs of our homeless and our highly transient students in the York City School District. Our plan is to work with um, faith-based organizations or other private organizations to create a sustainable model that different organizations would be able to go into the footprint of the schools in which they serve and create a dormitory style home that number one, empowers students, supports families, and most importantly, values York City that yes, we can do it here and we don't need to send our students outside of the city limits in order to experience a wonderful, I'm sorry, (laughs) a wonderful, nurturing, safe environment. The the plan would be that the students would stay at the dormitory Sunday night through Thursday night and then go back to their families through the weekends, Friday, Saturday, and come back to the dormitory for a family-style dinner on Sunday nights um, and to give them that kind of consistency. Anybody that's done their research knows that that 20% that you speak of, that it's a rotating door in and out of our schools. And we think that we've come up with a plan for about twenty-six to twenty-eight thousand dollars a year that we would be able to house, clothe, support students and their families. But the focus is on the students so that the families can do what they need to do to get on their feet and to do what they need to do and what they want to do. And I think that's what we need to remember: that our families want to do these things. It's not that they don't have a desire to love and nurture their children, but they do need sometimes an extra bit of support. So yes, Cornerstone Youth Home, and I welcome speaking with anybody else about this because we are in the process of of getting it off the ground. Thank you so much. We have uh, one right here. Hi, everybody. Um, I have a couple of, I guess I'm a big fan of community connections. So one of the things that I was just wondering if it would be possible, I know we don't have the money, we just don't, but we do have CareerLink up on 30 that is offering these career trainings that a lot of people can't get to. We do have um, a lot of ideas that are outside in the county. Is there a way, since we have space, that we could maybe coordinate and have some of those trainings be offered in the city? Since what we really need to do is to provide some kind of sustainability for the people that are here and teach people in this city how to make things work and how to actually be able to generate more income. And um, so if we could do some of those job trainings and bring those programs that already exist here to a space in the city. And if we could do, when we have Centro Hispano, which does Spanish translation, and we have a great business institute, but our business institute 
only happens in English and almost a third of our population is Hispanic. Our city website has great information. We don't have a Spanish version of our city's website. So if there was a way that we could maybe partner with some of these agencies that do translation, that um, do work in the Hispanic community to get more of the opportunities here translated into Spanish, both on paper, and even if it was just like once or twice a year doing those institutes. And um, the other, I know because Kevin's ready to just bust out of his tie, so I, I understand. And um, then the other suggestion that I had was if it was possible that um, we do have, uh, you know, in our schools, I know that we have a lot of, of students that are doing community service hours, things like that, and a lot of these students are already the translators for their families. You know, is it possible that we could do certain nights or certain activities where we made sure that those families who, you know, are, are just not aware, they're just not seeing or hearing what we're doing here, that we could actually use students to help translate and to help get that information out. I know most of my artist friends don't have cable, gave it up, and a lot of people that I work with in the school system don't have access to internet. And it seems like that's the way we wanna go, is putting everything on social media. And it's obviously not working, but a lot of the flyers still are. The Delta's put out a great newsletter that every organization that advertised in it actually saw a huge jump in attendance and participation for those activities. So even if we can't afford to print all of it, if there were some things that we could put on paper and get out to certain points in the neighborhoods, even if we allowed flyering for like city sanctioned posts, things like that, but a way that wasn't income dependent, and privilege dependent to be able to get the information out to people. I think that'd be really helpful. Thank you so much. Susan. Okay. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Kathleen Prendergast. I was on the Redevelopment Authority, probably it's been 10 or 15 years ago. I've always been involved in trying to encourage people to come into the city. I've been about a 20 year city resident. I have a home and office about two blocks from here on East Philadelphia Street. I see one of my neighbors, Nancy, over there, and she can confirm that I got two of my friends to buy buildings in our block within the past two months. I showed them through my house. I explained how economically beneficial it is to have a home office at that location, and they did purchase those buildings. The problem they're having now, though, is that when you're trying to start a small business in the city, and I know it goes back to when I was on the Redevelopment Authority, I know Kevin really worked on it, is it's is you almost need a guide to starting a small business in the city. And you call one department, and it's almost like a gotcha attitude. Did you get this permit? Have you been to HARB? Um, oh, you can't do this. Oh, you want to put up a sign, pay us this check. And I think we really need to look at the costs and the process and a guide so that people who do want to bring businesses to the city, who do want to bring jobs to the city, Every single person that they talk to, as soon as the words come out of their mouth, I'm trying to start a business in the city, I just brought a property in the city, it would be really nice if the people who answer the phone say, well, welcome to the city. Thank you for starting a business. Do you know about our guide to starting a business in the city? This is where you could go to get that information. We have a comment over here. Hi, everyone. I'm Steve. Um, and uh, as stated earlier, I do, I'm one of the co-founders of uh, Punks for Positivity. We do trash pickups. And we just, thank you. <clears throat> and then um, we also just uh, got the contract for the Garden of Hope, which is the oldest community garden in York. And we're hoping to uh, get that back on track, because it's just in bad shape. But um, on a positive note, um, we picked up, I want to say, at least 100 bags of trash a month, so do the quick math on well over 400 bags of trash, and we, our plan was to do a different community each week, and the past couple months, actually we took a little bit of a break, but the past, the end of the summer, we focused on Salem Square, A, because it's, there's just tons of trash and extremely neglected, but on the but the reason why we really wanted to stay is because it is the only community where the community actually came out and helped. 
you know, which is, is sad because, and, um, you know, and it was, it was all kids that came out and helped, and they were happy to help us. They, you know, they, they were just stoked we were there, which was real awesome. And that was kind of the whole purpose is to get the community involved. But the one thing I noticed is, and this is common across the board, any community you lived in, is the kids just wanted to be treated with respect and treated with love. And, you know, you know, I, I hear the same stuff like, why are you going in those areas? You're going to get shot. You're going to get stabbed. And no one, no one threatened us. No one said anything bad. You know, we got a bunch of like, that's awesome. We're glad you're here. We got donations, which was really awesome. And... You know, it just kind of re-motivated me for the, to keep doing it. And um, I don't know, it, we just got a lot of good feedback. And, and it's kind of funny because we did all over. And what I feel is one of the more harsher, quote unquote, areas is we got the most love and respect out of the, the community. And, and shockingly, the kids were the only ones who came out. And it kind of saddened me that that was the only community that people came out. You know, there's, I don't, would everyone say 45,000? people in York, and that was the only community, which is a little sad, but on the bright side, the kids do want to help. They want to feel part of, and if you have any ideas for us, we are more than willing to hear it. We're on Facebook. We have our own site, et cetera, et cetera, you know, and we just want to see how much we can give back, and, and we're just glad we were able to do it. Thank you. Hi, my name is Joel. Uh, I want to talk about something really mundane, but something I think you can control, and that's your tax rate. York sits in a metropolitan area of about 260,000 people, uh, about 30 to 35 municipalities that compete with York for a number of things. Uh, I, I was a property owner here for years, and I actually feel like I was driven out of the city by tax policy. I wasn't driven out because people were unfriendly or because business was bad. I simply couldn't afford to stay. Property taxes are, in many cases, let's just break it down. Property taxes in the city are 10 times what I pay in Spring Garden Township. Uh, my school taxes are about 60% of what they are here. The challenges, I understand, are very real. But if you look at the mercantile tax, maybe three to five times what it is in the surrounding communities, property tax anywhere from uh, one and a half to two times higher in the, in the city, in, in the school system, and 10 times higher city tax versus municipality, what you can do is, is challenge yourselves to use that tax, to reduce that tax and use that as an attractor. This is a competitive business. Running a city is a competitive business and you're in competition with every municipality that circles the city of York. If your taxes continue to go up, even at the same rate, the same percentage rate that they go up in an area where it already starts out with a, say, a 30% or 40 or 50 or 60% reduction, you will lose. And it's very easy for people to pick up and leave. As a school director in York Suburban, we see now a fairly significant number of people from the city coming into our school district. They're coming because it's economically feasible for them to come now. The houses are affordable and the taxes are much lower. As much as we like to complain about our taxes, they are nothing compared to what you have. You charge your residents 6% of the value, the assessed value of their house every year, which essentially means they can't own their houses. It almost doubles the mortgage payment. Those of you that came in recently and say you got a good deal on your houses, you know why you got a good deal? Take a look down at uh, South George and Springettsbury. Look at the, the renovated homes in that area that have been on the market for years with school property taxes of $30,000 per year. Pardon me? We appealed our valuation, our assessment, and it was lower 20%. Wow. Good for you. Not good for you. <laughs> Kevin? I'm sorry. You have to be, you have to be, you have to be attractive to, bi to business and industry, which means maybe holding the line on taxes and maybe even promising through your own good management to be able to reduce taxes and make that a, a binding promise to every business, not only to come into the city, but those who will stay here. And if you can't do that, you'll continue to, you'll continue to slough businesses. The action's at the table. Would you like to respond to any of that? Uh, 
Thomas, I don't know where he lives. Does he live in the city? Uh, All right. uh, Mayor Bracey has been committed to not raising taxes. Unfortunately, the, the budget is what it is. Over the last three years, taxes have not been raised. Uh, she came out publicly this April and committed, committed me to lowering property taxes 15% over the next five years. Unfortunately, we're only one piece of the pie. Harrisburg, Governor Wolf is trying hard to work on school tax reform. Unfortunately, somehow he lost in York County, and he's also losing in Harrisburg in his efforts to get that done. So there are people working very hard to make that happen. Unfortunately, it is what it is. This past year, we did not raise taxes, but we eliminated 35 positions. So we're doing what we can to bring the cost in line with what the tax rate is. It's not like it's going under someone's desk in a mattress, what have you. Every dollar coming in is being spent. So sacrifices and services, large item pickup, keeping the wrecks, uh, the grass cut on the, on the parks, cops on the street, ensuring public safety. It, it's, it's not going to waste, but it's a challenging equation and trying, we're trying very hard to balance. Thank you so much. So, we're, we're going to do a few more comments from the audience, and then we're going to do a, a, a sort of a wrap-up. We'd like, we'd like to hear what our panelists have heard. I know Kevin is dying to, to tell you what he heard and um, uh, respond to some, some of the comments. Hi, good evening. My name is Matthew Bubb. Um, I just want to say the crowd here is about a thousand times larger than with the uh, debates with the commissioners, because I just came from there. <laughs> so you guys uh, deserve a round just for that. Uh, I do want to voice the last two speakers. I have some agreement. Um, my neighbor, two doors down. My neighbor, one, one door down. I've owned a property in New York City for 20 years, and, um, which actually, apparently, this is the year that I'm selling it. Um, and I understand this is a fixing York, so let's come up with solutions on how to fix York. One of the things I've noticed is a uh, little background on me, I'm a developer. I used to own the old Smurfit Stone paper mill, which was a 30-acre property. We cleaned 3,000 truckloads of lead and PCBs off that site, sold it to York College for their expansion. Uh, it was a pretty complex transaction. It benefited the community. Um, I'm now working on the Yorktown paper mill redevelopment. And I want to thank Shavosky, who came to a meeting with the YCEDC uh, despite someone in that room asking me, why is he here? And I was absolutely floored that someone said that to me. And I said, this project sits in Spring Itsbury Township, it sits in Spring Garden Township. And the phrase we've all heard, a rising tide lifts all ships. And the other phrase I like is, experience is what you get when you didn't get what you expected. So. He jumped in to try and have some involvement with me because I had a company, which I can now share, it was a Lancaster Brewing, who wanted to move to York, create 100 jobs, was working with the governor's action team, and a small company we all know in York called Grand Packaging kindly offered to put in a bottling line to help them to create a beer venue, sort of like Trogues. For every manufacturing job, in a warehouse, in a manufacturing plant, there are three ancillary jobs, plumbers, electricians, roofers, that all get work because of that. And despite our best efforts, what I've discovered is, sadly, we have a border war between all of our municipalities. Um, Springsbury Township has put me in the position to fix a municipal sewer line they own. And I'm not in the sewer line development business, and the township manager said that I should have known to pressure test the sewer line before I bought the property. I said, let me get this right. I should have known to pressure test a municipal sewer line, which I don't own. And before we bought the property, we had discussions with you, but nobody shared this with, with us. And tomorrow, I'm meeting with the person that bought the 84 lumber property, who just moved here and is creating jobs and is in the same boat. 
and I would appreciate that Jim Gross took the time to meet with me as well um, to talk about the city having some involvement in letting us use potentially the same line that's been in use for 50 years. Uh, I asked Kevin Schreiber to jump in who tried to give an assist on this but I'm sort of stunned that the township manager in that township said to me that well I don't care about the jobs, the jobs are going to be in Spring Garden Township and I was flabbergasted. Uh, not that it matters but each township connects to this city and I sadly see that there is a lack of disconnect and so one of the, the, one of the questions I saw with the commissioners uh, tonight was should the York County commissioners and the county be helping the city they talked about the six hundred thousand dollars they give to help with police and other things it's all connected and the reality is yes we do have a tax issue that needs to be worked on yes we need to figure out how to have better spending we need jobs hey I love artists I've got a famous uncle that worked with Ansel Adams we got Jeff Koons we'd love to lure him into the city to invest money but at the end of the day we need real manufacturing jobs technology jobs coming here and it doesn't matter if they're in the city or not the reality is the YCDC, someone in that room saying, why is Shavosky here? Because those jobs are going to come from the city. They're going to come from Manchester. They're going to come from Spring Garden. They're going to come from Spring Berry. The reality is we got to work together to lift all that stuff. And I'm born and raised in York, lived on Roosevelt Avenue, lived on Pine Street. And I've been probably silent for too long. I, I look around and I go, this is a, a lot nicer crowd uh, I raced down here from this other meeting to see what's happening here and we want to fix York we need jobs how do we lure the jobs in that's where we need to work on okay maybe there's some incentive programs um, you know we've talked about Lerda we've talked about repositioning real estate all those things need to be fulfilled the other side is police fire it's all critical to a city I lived in the city for 10 years. Um, my next door neighbor just told me about gunfire. It happens everywhere. Let me tell you, crime is ubiquitous. I had somebody, I prefer not to really say the building, but a week ago, somebody dumped a dead body in front of a Lancaster building I own, and it was a drug dealer shooting another drug dealer. And as I said to the, the newspaper person that came to talk to me, I guess if our building jumped out and shot a drug dealer, maybe we should get an award. Um, but the fact that crime spilled over from one community to the next, it's going to happen, just like between these townships. So it's one of these where we've got to figure out working together. Thank you so much. That's some, somebody over here. This is really oversimplified, I, mean, I, I can't even touch where you're going. But what I wanted to say, Paula, when you stood up, thank you very much. I had volunteered with Paula off and on years ago. I have always volunteered ever since my children were small. And the, if we have to pick one word to use to fix York, to fix anything, anywhere, is volunteer. Pick a topic that you're interested in. Right now, I'm volunteering with the Catholic Harvest Food Pantry. I've been with them for over 30 years. I volunteer at the library. I was very proud to work with those students who brought their homework to me, you know, and sat there and worked with them. And there's nothing will touch your heart more when a child comes back two days later to tell you, thank you, I passed my test. You need to volunteer and whatever you're interested in, whether you want to clean up a neighborhood, you know, clean off the graffiti, pick up the garbage, work with the students, feed the hungry. There's a lot you can do. Just look for it. Okay, uh, we got one time for one more and then we're gonna, we're gonna uh, let the panelists uh, sort of respond. You go ahead. I returned to York after 40 years being away and I'm proud and glad that I came back.
I would like to address basically two issues. This nation was founded on the idea that we have self-government. Self-government in the eyes of our founders was individuals taking responsibility for their own actions and having an unlimited opportunity to succeed without a lot of government regulation and taxation. Now we've talked about taxation today. We talked about taxation today and I can give you a story of having worked for a Fortune 500 company and I was in a position to make recommendations as to where we should put new facilities and where we should hire our people to work. And I have some sad news to tell you about Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is not a right to work state. So what this means is that the big corporations and businesses are taking their new facilities down to right to work states like Alabama, South Carolina, North Carolina, Florida. So the one thing that we need to do is to have our General Assembly do a better job of making sure that we have an opportunity to attract new jobs. And the only way we're going to do that is to do the right thing and set up Pennsylvania as a right to work state. Thank you. Mike. I just wanted to follow up briefly on the comment, was it Jerry, for, uh, about the uh, taxes? Um, it mentioned that we have to compete with everybody else, and I don't think that's exactly the case. I, I do agree that we have to bring the taxes down, we have to do everything we can, uh, but we are in a competition with other cities because luckily we are in the midst of a back to the city movement. Lots of people want to come to cities, which means we've got to get more competitive with Lancaster, Harrisburg, Altoona, all the cities. You can't expect us and all the resources that are required for the police and the fire. We've got a lot of things going on in 5.2 square miles and there's just no way we can be competitive with broad expanses of houses that don't require the kind of resources that we do. But what we can do is get competitive with these other cities and make York the most attractive of the cities. That way when people are looking around with the back to the city movement, they'll say York is the place to go. Thank you very much. So I know that I know everybody has other things to say, but I, I, I want to uh, take some time and, and talk to our panelists a little bit. What did you hear tonight? Have you heard anything that was actionable? Have you heard uh, ideas that, uh, that you think that you can help foster to fix York, to, to try to improve things? Uh, just, you know, you'll get a chance to maybe respond to some of the, the comments. You know, tr try to keep it to a couple minutes or so. Is that directed at me? Okay, <clears throat> I'm gonna try to be as, as brief as possible, and so I'm gonna talk really fast, and if you have questions afterwards, I'll, I'll hit them up. Okay, so uh, I was glad that Matt pointed out that we're not just fixing York City. We, are, we do have problems throughout all of York County that we do have to address, and these are relevant throughout our entire Commonwealth. We are incredibly fragmented as a state. We are far too parochial. We have 72 municipalities in York County alone. We do not need 72 municipalities in York County in 2015. So by that stretch, we have a whole lot of duplication of services, a whole lot of uh, competition. We have, while we aren't competing as a region against other regions, we're competing against Spring Garden versus North York versus West York, which is absolutely backwards and, and asinine in the grand scheme of things. So we do need to be less parochial, and that takes a lot of work because when you start talking about regionalization, it sounds good on paper, it's 
good when you talk about it, but people come out and fight it in droves when you talk about cooperation and intermunicipality. So we do need to be able to set that aside. And it's not so much the city, it's often our surrounding municipalities that have a tendency to not want to do business with the city or view it as bailing out the city. So that's one thing, um, you know, in 1996, Tom Wolf was CEO of, a, of a Better York and Wolf Organization, and he helped author the Rusk Report in partnership with York Daily Record. This was a Bible for regionalization that we've done a miserable job on implementing. Um, so we do really need to, to try to address some of these issues, and at the core, it's going to be top down. So on that, uh, Carla, I just wanted to mention and give a shout out to Martin Library, our host. Martin Library is actually partnering with PA Career Link to offer job placement, job training, resume prep, all those courses here. Uh, as well, we're working with them to potentially, with the city and everyone else, do an expungement seminar, which would help individuals that may have had a mistake in their past go through the very arduous, onerous process of going of, of uh, requesting an expungement, which we know will help people clean up their records, which leads to job placement and all that stuff that goes along with it. Um, on the property tax issue, I, I mean, obviously, you know, this is a, a battle that we fought in the state for three decades and we still can't seem to get traction on. Now, you know, Governor Wolf has obviously put forth a very aggressive proposal initially in his budget pr uh, presentation, which would have uh, effectively lowered the city residents' tax bill by about 65% cumulatively. Now, obviously, that created the, the immediate opposition, which we often hear, which is it, it creates winners and losers. And unfortunately, the city of York for many years has been a loser. And that's why I object that, I, I refute that winners and losers argument because there are winners and losers right now. And we do need to reform these policies to lower the level of disparity because right now, as, as Joel had mentioned, we are competing, but the city of York, in its effort to compete on property tax, we have 37% of our real estate that is tax exempt. That is, I think, three times in terms of value, if not, well, it's, it's more than that, but anyway, so 37% of our real estate is tax exempt. To the city of York government, that would mean $10 million. That's 100 police officers. Uh, that is an incredible eight ball that we start every budget year behind. So the city of York government, the mayor has to go into every Mike Dowry meeting and say, all right, we're 10 million in the hole. How do we dig ourselves out of it? With the over-dependence on property tax, that's the only real revenue generating mechanism. To the school district, that would mean $48 million. Dr. Holmes, I don't know what you could do with $48 million, but I'm sure you could do a lot of good with it. Uh, and, and despite the fact that 37% of that real estate is real estate that generally supports a lot of the hospital, our churches, our, our social service organizations. These are not just organizations that support only city residents, while some do, but ultimately city taxes are subsidizing their tax exemption. And that is fundamentally unfair, and that's wrong, and that does need to change. Now, I had proposed a couple, a year ago, that the county do a regional asset tax, or you know, we do something else to help level that out, give municipalities a payment to offset their tax exempt rate to all 72 municipalities. Obviously that was received more as Triber wants to increase taxes. So we need to get beyond that and talk responsibly about taxes because they're not a four letter word. You can do good with them. And there are ways that we could reform property taxes right here in the county with only two, vo two votes by the county commissioners. You wouldn't need 102 in the house. You wouldn't need 26 in the Senate and a governor. So that's one way to do it along those lines. The other, and I know I'm trying to go quick, Okay, all right. <laughs> so along those lines of the city supporting a lot of non-city-based services, we have 43,000 residents in the city of York. We also have 44,000 commuters into the city of York. Every day, 44,000 people. We double the city population. The city residents take home an earned income of about $100 million a year. I want to thank Mike Dowry for pulling this for me. So city residents earn $100 million a year. City commuters earn $825 million a year. So we can see who makes more money. However, the law is structured, this is a state law, that everyone pays earned income tax, right? We all pay the EIT. The EIT goes to the municipality you live in, not the one you work in, despite the fact that you need the one that you work in to provide services to get to work and in case you have fire, cops, all that stuff. So I would propose splitting it 50-50. So split it between the municipality you live in and the one you work in. The downside to that and why I don't see it passing in this General Assembly is that inevitably suburban communities would lose money in that uh, and therefore would probably not vote against it because ultimately those suburban communities would then have to rely upon property taxes. So ultimately that's one big argument. There are a lot of big initiatives that we could do but we need populations like yourselves to help speak louder about it, support some of those in initiatives. 
you know, and try to get beyond just the winners and lo losers argument of killing, killing any type of discussion. So, thank you. Um, oh, and the one thing that I did learn that I would like to challenge, the positivity. Um, obviously, positivity is contagious and we need more of it. Um, I, we heard, I think it was Jim that mentioned, uh, help with homeowners in rehabbing houses. That is actually something I would challenge the community. We do need help. There used to be funds. That was cut. That was federal money that was cut. And ultimately, we don't have that. We get a lot of calls. The city gets a lot of calls. We refer it to churches, sometimes Habitat. Sometimes it's friends of friends that will help. I would challenge the community, help us come up with a program, help us allocate the resources, help us find the talented individuals that would go out and help an individual on a fixed income fix their house up. So at the end of the day, thank you guys. Uh, this was awesome. Thank you. <laughs> And thanks for allowing me that time. Uh, first of all, I want to direct my comments to the young lady right here on volunteering. I've been a volunteer in this city for the last seven years, being on York City School Board. No pay involved. So, I mean, was I losing it up here? Or what did I say to myself? I was needed, you know. My children all graduated. I raised grandchildren. So it was time for me to do something for the city. And speaking of the city, now, I, I don't know, your city school district graduated lawyers, doctors, the whole gambit. So what is wrong with our school district that we can't continue to do that? Have you all ever looked and asked yourselves a question, why is it that for-profit entities have not ever gone to the counties? to suburban, central, and the like, to open up charter schools. We know we have to educate every child living in this city. But when our resources are pulled in every direction, how can you do it? We all have to band together to keep this district alive, do the right thing for all of our children. Because we support our charter school children, we do. Their support comes from us. So we have to support our charter schools. So please, as far as taxes go, city, we haven't raised taxes in three years. I'm a homeowner, I can't afford it. I'm living on a fixed income. So I cannot see my taxes continue to rise. Landlords, yes, there have, they are some bad ones, but we do have some good ones. You have horrible tenants. And when you have to take a tenant, I've had, <laughs> I've had to take approximately three tenants to a rental property that I had. I take them to the magistrate. I have to pay money to sue them to the magistrate. I don't recoup any money. So I'm thinking to myself, okay, I bought this property to help me hold on to the one I live in. So what do I do then? Okay, well, that's no longer a problem for me. Thank goodness. But like I said, folks, please, we have to band together to keep this district afloat. Stop letting other people come in here telling us what to do with our money. Let's do this for our own district. 40,000 people live in the city of York. We're not a big city, so where do they think we get this money from to be giving them to come in here and tell us how to run our district? We don't need that. This is the only person we need right here. I guess if the question was, what have I taken from the evening, I, I think it's important to note that everyone here is here because they care, because they want to do something positive to help the city of York. So I'm going to give you a charge. Uh, I, we all recognize the importance of the school district of the city of York and the impact that it has on the success of this community. The community cannot be successful without a successful school district. It's just that simple. Uh, it leads to economic success. It leads to all sorts of successes. But the bottom line is that if we don't do what we need to do, then the community doesn't succeed. With that being the case, we've also talked about resources and the lack of resources. And we all agree there's not enough to go around, and we're fighting each other over the scraps. Doesn't seem to be fair. That's life. So we can either complain about it or we can do something about it. There is a resource that doesn't really cost a lot from your pocket, and that's called the resource of time. We have a mentor program that we're starting at York High. We realized a long time ago 
that the best way for a child to be successful is for that child to be supported throughout their entire educational life, from kindergarten to 12th grade. And so how do we make those children successful? What sort of, what sort of supports can we give to them so that they can move forward? The idea of the mentor program and the idea of the internship program for our high school students is one that we believe will work and one that we believe will change how your CHI is viewed and how the city is viewed. But in order to have a mentor program, we need mentors. We can't do it with just the teaching staff that we have. We need dedicated, caring individuals from our community who will give of their time to mentor a student. Doesn't take hours, doesn't take weeks. It takes a phone call. It takes a meeting every once in a while. It takes a contact for you to let that child know that you care about what's happening in their life and that you support what they're doing. And imagine what we can do with the 1,300 students that attend York High if we had a mentor for every single student, someone from our community. What could we do if we had businesses who would allow our seniors to do internships in our community? Those are things that we can do without a whole lot of money or without a whole lot of fanfare. So my charge, my challenge to you tonight is to talk to us about that. If you're interested in being a mentor, get in contact with me. If you're interested in having your business work with the high school to offer internships, not paid, just an opportunity for kids to come and see the world of work firsthand. So those are some of the, the actionable things I think we can take from this evening. And I really appreciated the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Holmes. Thank you, Scott. Thank you to the entire table over there, Representative and Director Orr. We appreciate you all and all that you do. We, the city administration, work closely with the city school district because we are all one. I want to thank all of you. I don't think I've seen one person leave, at least didn't come back. Um, and I, I take that as a testament that you all truly want to work with all of us to make this community better. And I'm not just saying the city of York, Matt pointed it out first. It is the entire community of York County that we all need to focus on and work closely with it. And many of you do that, and I thank you. Our administration stands ready to continue to work with you. There are a, a, we're a host of ideas, given obviously areas of improvement for all of us, um, beyond just the, the city government the city of York, the county of York, all of us. And we do appreciate those feedback, those comments, and we take it as um, areas that we all should work on, as I indicated, and we will. So please know that we stand ready. Some of you already have the direct numbers of these individuals, my office. We stand ready to continue to work with you to make the necessary improvements in our community. Thank you all very much again for being here. Thank you. And you're summing up for the entire crew here. Does anybody else have anything that they'd like to say? Chief Cayley? Sorry, I just wanted to add one more thing. We, <laughs> when, when we talk about our community and, and we try and take this opportunity as much as we can, you, you look across the nation, it's not a good time to be a cop. Everybody complains about what we do and how we do it. Everybody complains about how our, the police departments look within inner cities. Uh, one thing we need is we need your help. Maybe not necessarily your help, but if this police department in York is going to look like the city and be part of the community, we need people from within. The best police officers that I work with came from in the city here. Uh, they have a great connection to the people that are here. They can help solve crime. And I'm not insulting the rest of the officers because you have a fantastic police department and I get to go all over the place and see different departments. I'm not insulting anyone, but you have a great police department. But we need the help from the people that live in the community to want to become police officers. And I'm talking about people of color. Uh, we need Spanish speaking officers. We need officers from the African American community. And we need you to find good candidates for us. We're getting ready to hope, hopefully hire because uh, our numbers are down. But uh, you see how I threw that in there, Michael? <laughs> but we just, to get six candidates that are possibilities, we just went through 70 people on our list. So we need good candidates, 
and we need to find a way to make sure if they can't afford it to get to the police academy and get some training so that they can become ahead of time, they can become uh, people that not only York City will want, but the surrounding police departments. So go to your churches, go to wherever, and, uh, you know, and talk, to, talk to your people, talk to your friends. It's, it's a great job, and it needs to become a job that's sought after here in the city. Thank you so much. I, I just want to thank everybody for coming out tonight and having such great, great, great comments. And get, why don't you give yourselves a, a round of applause just for, uh, for your caring about so much about this community. So we're going to end with a very special treat. Uh, Mr. Vonnie Grimes is going to play the national anthem on, with his harmonica. Thank you and good night.